The Oracle Network. Monsters, demons, ghosts, and guys. Oh my, I didn't see you there. You really spooked me. Just like my podcast, The Paranormal Burrito. We're a weekly podcast featuring a new guest every episode. So join us for fun and spooky stories. If you have a spooky story you'd like to share, email us at theparanormalburrito at gmail.com. The Paranormal Burrito, your true stories. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. I'm your host, CJ. As I've already told some of you, I just got off of a brief stint of serving jury duty. I just don't know why I'm always being called for child sexual abuse cases. The past three or four times I've been called for jury duty, this is what the case has been. Which to me is just so damn sad that there's so many cases like this. Shit, people, give me a good adult-on-adult murder case, and I'm your woman. But the child sexual abuse? Uh Uh-uh. After I tell the panel I worked with children for 30 years and I've been an advocate for children at least that long, the prosecutor starts salivating and the defense attorney usually just shakes their head. I then always tell them anyone who hurts children, the elderly or animals, deserves to be locked up forever. Then I get dismissed. The best thing that ever comes from jury duty for me is that I'm able to complete a lot of work. I got this episode's case researched and written in two days. That's a great accomplishment for me. This is probably going to be a little longer episode. So if you're like me, tell your ADD to please be patient. I have a lot of information to get through before getting to the actual case. Let's start with find me on the socials. At Facebook, I'm Beyond the Rainbow Podcast. And my page is Rainbow Crimes. I'm on Instagram at Beyond the Rainbow Pod and Rainbow Crimes 12. And I'm on Twitter at Rainbow Crimes. On my website at Beyond the Rainbow Podcast.com, you can find a link to some cool swag from T Republic. You can also find out a little more about me, and you can see the expansive list of missing but not forgotten LGBTQ people I have going. This episode's missing but not forgotten LGBTQ person is once again Diana Gonzalez of Winter Haven, California. I did an episode back on October 6th of 2020 that covered her case. She's the missing Hispanic mother of five kids. She was dating a butch bitch named Daniela Meaden that goes by Danny Boy. There's new information from the family search parties. Maybe you remember a couple episodes ago I spoke about how nobody searches for a missing person like the loved ones. Well, the case of Diana Gonzalez proves just this. Back in October 2020, the family and friends of Diana went to the reservation that Danny Boy lived on, and they searched Danny Boy's trailer. Not too much could be found, mostly because the old man groundskeeper, Ed Dupee, he kind of saw to it that they weren't able to look everywhere that they would have liked to have. Well, yesterday, March 13th, 2021, The search party, which was mostly women, (laughs) and not just women, these are some of the strongest women you've ever seen. Well, they were back with a vengeance. The family sent me video of their search. It looks like the search party started at some desert land near a canal. They're being watched over by reservation police who want to make sure that there's no trouble. Then the search party moved to Danny Boy's trailer and this is on the reservation that Ed Dupee looks after. They went into Danny Boy's trailer. What we, the viewer, is hit with is a living environment of filth, but the lack of cleanliness isn't the most disturbing thing that's seen on this video. There's areas in the trailer that appear to have blood splatters. 
There's also a mattress and a pillow that weren't in the trailer when the family searched in October. What appeared to be blood splatter was on the ceiling, the wall, and both the mattress and the pillow. It seems like the mattress and pillow had been put back after the first search by the family and the police, and before Danny Boy was yet arrested again. Yep. That bitch is currently in jail for the same shit, different day, different girlfriend. Domestic violence of her new girlfriend, Margie Kulik. With threats to kill Margie, Margie and Diana's family have been in communication. Margie even drove from Arizona to California to bring Diana's mom some of Diana's possessions. In it were some of Diana's personal items, some clothing, and probably most important, some rings. Rings Diana would have never removed from her fingers on her own. It seems as though when Danny Boy gave these rings to Margie, she also confessed to killing Diana, and she showed her where she had buried her. But if Danny Boy did tell her where Diana is buried, Margie's not talking. And I have to be honest about something. As impressed as I was with Diana's family... I was cringing a little bit when I was watching the video. They were in the trailer touching things without gloves. I kept thinking, no, wait, you might contaminate something. But after looking in the trailer, the searchers started to look around the property. And I swear to you, Diana's family are badasses. There's this area outside that the family was kept from going near in October. The old man, Ed Dupee, said that wild animals live back there. Don't go. He even told that to the police, and the police didn't. Well, this time, the family got back there. There were some trash bags and wadded up clothing. In the video, Diana's Aunt Nancy's on her hands and knees. She's digging in the dirt, an area that looks kind of suspicious. She's using her hands, she's using sticks, and finally she's using a metal rod that was found to move the dirt and dig deeper. Unfortunately, nothing but a trash bag was uncovered. By now, the sheriff arrived. I counted four or five different law enforcement vehicles. A female deputy comes over to speak to the family, and they tell her about the blood splatters they saw inside the trailer. The deputy tells the family to stay where they're at, and then a female deputy and a male deputy, they go into the trailer, they look at the scene in the trailer, and while they're in there, the deputy calls who I believe is the detective that's in charge of this case. That would be Detective Hurtado. The same lead investigator that gave Diana's family his number, but he won't pick up. He's always out or on vacation, and he definitely won't call him back. Anyway, this female deputy comes back out to the family, and she tells the family she was told that the scene has already been examined and all the evidence and DNA they needed was taken. The family inquires when they'll know the results. And of course, the deputy has no clue and says it depended when the samples were taken. What really sucks is because the lead detective won't call back Diana's family, they have to rely on each other to look for clues as to where Diana is. Shit like this is what gives law enforcement a bad name. No one's asking for all the cards in their hand. Just give the family some reassurance they need that something's being done to find Diana. So the video where Danny Boy's trailer is is pretty well wrapped up. And that's when this aggressive as fuck meth head looking motherfucker approaches Diana's family. He starts calling Diana a bitch and yelling that she's still alive. Naturally heated, the family yells back, Oh yeah? You know so much? Prove she's still alive. And that's when an agitated male sheriff steps in, and he starts telling the family to get off the property, in spite of it being Meth Man who began the verbal altercation. Here's what I think. I think the sheriff's department is just pissed that the family's doing their job better than they are. The search for Diana continues. The search for justice and answers for her family continues. Danny Boy remains in jail, but Margie... Danny's latest victim, has been trying to raise the 10% of the $500,000 to bail Danny out. Diana's family believes if Danny's able to make bail, she will flee to elude law enforcement. Oh, and something I forgot to mention earlier, 
there were three wigs found in the trailer also. All three wigs belonged to Danny Boy, who used them to hide from law enforcement before, so she could go out for a drink or hang out at the casino if she wanted to. When is enough enough? When will the local Imperial Valley Sheriff call in the big boys, like the FBI in San Diego, to get some real answers and get this demon Danny boy locked up for good so she'll stop hurting other women? For our next order of business, Rainbow Warriors, I'd like to read you an email I received via my website just a few days ago. It's in regards to my first episode of Season 4, the Christine Choppa and Molly Olgin case. The case of the two teenage lesbians that were attacked and one was murdered? This happened at a park that overlooked the bay near Corpus Christi, Texas. If you don't remember the case, you might want to take a re-listen for a refresher. The episode was a collaboration case I did with my friend Lisa from Texla True Crime. The resources we used were articles and court documents from the appellate courts. We weren't paraphrasing the facts. It's what was written by a court stenographer at the trial, and a multitude of articles that were written by journalists. While it's true I like to inject my own commentaries and opinions, the sources we used are published documents. So basically the emailer was enlightening us to some ideas that we might have gotten wrong from the sources we used to research the case. And that's cool. It's important to address other ideas involving this case of Molly and Christine. So, here's the email I received. Season 4, Episode 1, Molly Olgin and Christine Choppa. Number 1. David Strickland and Dylan Spellman were not friends. They had interacted at least once in a group of people, but Strickland felt that they were not the kind of crowd that he could get along with. And Spellman was also attracted to David's girlfriend, Laura. Okay, Warriors, here's my note on this. I don't believe we ever claimed that the two suspects were friends. I hadn't even realized they had met before. And Laura's actually Strickland's wife, not girlfriend. However, I guess she could have been just the girlfriend when Strickland met Spellman. Number two, Detective Vulliman, who charged Strickland, was previously his friend until they had something of a falling out. In trial, Vulliman offloaded this personal connection onto his wife, saying that she had personally known Strickland when he was the one that had more of a relationship with Strickland than his wife did. Vulliman and his friends are dirty. Vulliman was also personally acquainted with Chris Melkor. Okay, Rainbow Warriors, this is my note on that. In case you don't remember, Chris Melkor was the military guy that David Strickland lived with in Colorado. And then they had a falling out before David came to Texas. Number three, the allegation that the letter contained details only the killer could know is flat out false, which I can personally attest to. The police said this because the details in question were not publicly released. But that doesn't mean that nobody else could know. Some details were spread by word of mouth through medical staff in the area. On top of that, Volomen was directly leaking information about the investigation to Strickland himself. I've known Strickland since 2009, and I was involved with this case, though my involvement has never been reported by the media or publicly acknowledged by law enforcement. My name can be found in the trial transcript. Christine Choppa is aware of me, but probably knows little or nothing about my involvement in the case. I won't give you any further information, as I'm involved with a production. I've already divulged the above on social media. But I want to tell you unequivocally that this case is a big, fat lie, of which Aaron Volman and his personal buddy, District Attorney Sam Smith, are the guardians. If anything... Strickland's biggest mistake was getting involved with the likes of Melkor and Volomin in the first place. I don't want to see this case used to bring awareness to anti-LGBT hate crimes while the finger is being falsely pointed at Strickland. Spellman is the killer and the cops and DA have been manipulating Christine and the Olgin family this entire time. So there you have it. 
Honestly, I've always believed Dylan Spellman is the attacker and David Strickland is wrongfully incarcerated. But I also believe it's a hate crime. Not by Strickland, but by Spellman. There was a female witness who saw a tall, broad-shouldered man running to his car after she heard two gunshots. That fits Spellman's physique. The unfortunate thing is that Christine, who suffered from traumatic brain injury, picked out Strickland, who is more of a petite man. The poor girl was traumatized, and she had a brain injury to boot. You can't blame her if she got her identification wrong. Strickland was pretty much put away based on her testimony. There was a lot more evidence against Spellman. Spellman's pube was even found on Christine's body. He admits to being in the park that night. Spellman's defense attorney said, Oh, that pubic hair must have fallen off his body and blew onto Christine's body. The park's not that small. In fact, Spellman's DNA was in several places in that park. It was on cigarette butts and a monster energy drink can. I'm sure his pube just fell off him and blew its way onto Christine's naked body. Bullshit. Both girls were raped by their assailant, and that's where the pube came from. David Strickland's is probably a case the Innocence Project should take a hard look at. Law enforcement don't always get it right. The law enforcement involved in this case sound pretty sketchy at best. I don't doubt the corruption allegations. Too many times it seems that detectives are quick to call it a wrap just because they want to hurry up and file it away. And it appears in this case, there might have even been some type of vendetta against Strickland by one of the lead investigators. Was it personal? That sounds a hell of a lot more likely than the random pube from a different suspect miraculously landing on one of the victims. Also, that Detective Velleman that the emailer mentioned, he was fired for leaking information about the case to the book author, Shiva Sandage, and I'm probably butchering her name. I apologize. The detective very possibly only leaked a skewed information to put more heat on Strickland and take the scent off of Spellman. The point is, a killer, in my opinion, is still walking around. I hope Christine Chapa will be safe from this horrible human, and I hope that others will be safe. But with him not incarcerated, nobody's really safe. Okay, on with the episode. The plan was five years in the making. And he might have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for that pesky eye health app on their phones. For six years, his wife had known about his extramarital affairs with other men. Guys he met on Grinder for a night of unadulterated sexual pleasure. Yes, she knew about his affairs with various men. She tried to let it go because more than anything, she loved her husband, and she wanted a child with Matesh. She was submissive and compliant to Matesh's wishes. Jessica, wanting to grace Matesh with the gift of a child, had even went through a series of in vitro fertilization treatments to try to become pregnant. How could she have known that Matesh was purposely taking a drug that would suppress his sperm count? But let's rewind and take our timeline back to the start of their relationship. Jessica and Matesh knew each other as children. They both lived in and were part of a Hindu community in the UK. The two reconnected again as adults, and they started to date for a brief period of time. This is when they were both getting their general studies done at the University of Leicester. But studies and schooling interfered with their romantic lives so a kibosh was put on that. In 2006, they both began to go to pharmaceutical school, and they started to see each other again. By 2008, Jessica was speaking to her father about potentially marrying Matesh. In 2009, they did marry, and they seemed very much in love. However, things aren't always what they seem. In the first year of marriage, Jessica was telling her sisters, Matesh pretty much just ignored her all the time. They hadn't been intimate since they first married ten months ago. He was also becoming very controlling, 
Mitesh had a secret, a truth he buried so deep it didn't rear its ugly head for several years after they were married. Mitesh's truth was that he was gay, and Jessica was his perfect fitting beard. Now, being gay wasn't the ugly part of his truth. The ugly part was the deception of someone who loved him so much. Mitesh was a coward. He hid behind his wife, Jessica, because being gay and Hindu would surely bring shame to his family. And that's why Mitesh suppressed his homosexuality the best he could. That is, until Jessica began to get wise to him. In 2010, Jessica's grandfather was dying, and Mitesh refused to let Jessica go see her grandfather or her family. And if he did allow it, he would drive her and the visit would only last for a few minutes. After the last visit, Jessica got back into the car with Mitesh. She started to argue that she needed more time, and Mitesh hit her, causing her to not question him ever again about it. Often when Mitesh would get angry or seemingly frustrated, he'd aggressively put his hands around her neck and squeeze hard, as if he were trying to strangle her. He'd do this for no apparent reason. Jessica would tell her younger sisters these stories over the phone. The sisters were concerned for Jessica's welfare, but they didn't know how to help her. Jessica and Mitesh went on to graduate from pharmaceutical school that year. They accepted jobs at a pharmacy shortly after. Mitesh continued to be horribly abusive to Jessica. He'd hit her if she said or did anything he didn't like, and he'd also continue to go through the strangling motions. Mitesh had some serious anger issues. Most likely this was related to his sexuality and having to keep it a secret. In 2011, Jessica confides in co-workers her beliefs that Mitesh is gay. Matesh would come home from work every night. He'd get on his phone with what sounded like a man. If she walked into the room, he'd continue his conversation walking away to an upstairs loft room. He'd spend hours on the phone with some man, and sometimes he wouldn't join Jessica in bed until after 4 a.m. In 2012, Matesh took Jessica on a vacation for a week. He spent nearly the whole trip on his phone with a man. When they returned, Jessica found an intimate text from another man on her husband's phone. The other man was a doctor, Dr. Amit Patel. This was Matesh's gay love, his soulmate, the one who made his loins burn. Dr. Amit coincidentally had the same last name as Matesh. Patel must be a common Hindu name, such as Smith, Jones, and Johnson are in the U.S., Matesh would text the doctor, I really have fallen for you, dear. I love you. And the doctor would reply, I feel exactly the same. If I had any doubts, they're all gone. In 2013, Matesh sent the doctor a note. He was coming clean that he had lied to him about something. He told the doctor he was actually married to Jessica. He proceeded to tell the doctor, She fell in love with me and I was all... Uh, Great, this will be my cover-up. He assured Dr. Patel that he's not in love with Jessica. She does not bring him the pleasure and joy that the doctor does. Matesh then invites the doctor to stay over, introducing him to Jessica as his friend. In 2015, Matesh and Jessica put a lease on a pharmacy of their own. It's at this time Matesh's parents start applying the pressure onto Matesh to start a family have children. But of course, most of the blame for not having the children yet goes on to Jessica. Matesh's family, especially his mother, loved to put Jessica down and ridicule her. Matesh ends up lying to his family. He tells them Jessica's pregnant, and then he goes on to expand on it. He says Jessica is pregnant with twins. As much as she wanted to have a child with Matesh, Jessica wanted it to come organically. She didn't want to feel like she had to have it right this minute. That same year is when Jessica began in vitro fertilization treatment. After Matesh dropped this huge-ass lie to his family, 
She feels it's her job to conceive quickly now. Mitesh thinks it's hilarious that his family believes they're having twins. In 2016, Mitesh's doctor lover would move to Australia, leaving Mitesh holding his dick in his hand until he could figure out his next move. He writes again to his doctor about his sham marriage with Jessica. She is just leasing me. Some day that lease will be up. My feelings for you haven't changed. I love you so much it's inexplainable. Now you have the truth. You have made me so happy. You have no idea how much. I'll make you happy too, I'm sure of it. I've searched for you so hard, but now I've found you and I don't want to lose you. I finally feel complete. Love, Mitts. The doctor wrote back, I still don't like sharing you, that's all. I may have the truth, but I can't cuddle up next to that, can you? Mitesh tells the doctor, Don't worry, her days are numbered. All alone in her thoughts, poor Jessica was prescribed antidepression and anti-anxiety meds by her doctor. The domestic abuse, the knowledge her husband would prefer to have sex with men, and the hurry up to get pregnant were all taking a toll on Jessica's mental state. The following year in 2017, Mitesh was caught on CCTV in his own pharmacy. He was kissing and groping another man, who was not necessarily believed to be the doctor, since the doctor now lived in Australia. Perhaps it was a one-and-done type deal. It's at this time it's found out Mitesh has been taking the sperm-lowering drug. That same year, Jessica and Mitesh go to the in vitro clinic together. Her eggs are collected, and so is some of his sperm. And I'm pretty sure he asked them to put on some gay porn so he could entice his swimmers out. On May 8, 2018, Jessica was informed that her eggs and Mitesh's sperm created three fertilized embryos. The embryos were then frozen. The following month, a doctor would thaw one out and implant it into Jessica's uterus to see if it would take. Jessica was exuberant. Mitesh wasn't as excited. He would have been if his co-parent would have been the doctor instead of Jessica. For the past five years, Mitesh felt trapped. He knew he couldn't divorce Jessica. It would be a disgrace to his community and his family to divorce his wife because he was gay. Unheard of. He would need to kill her. Yes, of course. Obviously, it would be an honor killing. In honor for him to live his gay life with his lover in Australia. With her dead, he can move on with his life elsewhere. Take the embryos, pay another woman to give birth to one, and he and his doctor would have their own little family. And it'd all be so honorable. But wait. First, he would need to take out a two million pound life insurance policy on Jessica. Two million pounds is roughly over two and a half million U.S. dollars. Text between the doctor and Mitesh would continue on. Mitesh telling the doctor about the possibility of Jessica having a baby. Mitesh asked the doctor if he would love the baby. The doctor replied, only if there was no one else attached to it, meaning Jessica. On the evening of May 14, 2018, 34-year-old Jessica arrived home from the pharmacy at 7.10 p.m. As soon as she walked in, she was attacked by her 37-year-old husband, Matesh Patel. He put a plastic grocery bag over her head, which she was struggling to take off. And while she was struggling, he was able to inject Jessica with insulin. She fought and she scratched Matesh's neck up pretty good. Injecting someone who isn't diabetic with a fast-acting insulin can cause dizziness, headache, confusion, profuse sweating, seizures, and sometimes death. Jessica was a fighter. She just wasn't dying fast enough for Matesh. It had been 20 minutes now, so he put the plastic grocery bag back over her head and he made damn good and sure she was dead. He took off the bag, and then he bound her with duct tape for realism. As Jessica lay dead, 
Mitesh ran around their home, making it look like a robbery gone wrong scene. And just how do we know this, you ask? Well, both Jessica and Mitesh had an app on their iPhones. The app is called iHelp. It's factory installed on your iPhone when you get it, and it stays on unless you delete it. You might even have one on your iPhone. The app tracks your movements and the times of day that you're active. Jessica's iHealth app stopped showing any activity from her around 7.37 p.m. Shortly after 7.37 p.m., Mitesh's iHealth app, it was going crazy with movement. It suggested that this is the time he was racing around to stage the house as if a break-in occurred. Drawers from dressers were pulled out, and their contents were strewn about the rooms. Clothing, papers, and other personal items all cluttered the floor. Tables, chairs, and lamps were tipped over. Mitesh ran upstairs and downstairs, trashing their home. At around 8.40 p.m., he finally called 999. That's the UK's emergency services number. When police arrived, they questioned Mitesh. He said he'd been out on a walk and then went to get something to eat. When he came home, the house was in disarray, and Jessica was there lying on the floor. Mitesh then showed the police the ransacked rooms. Jessica's family was called, and her sisters rushed to the couple's home. The sisters comforted Mitesh. They held his hand, told him everything would be all right, and Mitesh played along, allowing Jessica's sisters to comfort him. Police saw through Mitesh's story, though. They saw the flaws. They saw the scratch marks on his neck. He became an immediate suspect. The police seized Mitesh and Jessica's cell phones. They took Mitesh's computer, surveillance tapes of the home security system, and they obtained a search warrant to search not just the home, but the pharmacy as well. The search of the pharmacy found four syringes. Three of them were full with insulin, and one was empty. They found the duct tape, the same duct tape that was used on Jessica. They found a safe that had 25,000 pounds, and it was full of gold jewelry. Mitesh was arrested three days after Jessica was murdered. He, of course, claimed innocence. And so his trial began. Mitesh was in rare form, and he had excuses for everything. He was questioned why he erased the search query of, Will three milliliters of insulin kill me? Mitesh's excuse was that sometimes his finger accidentally swipes things away on his phone. He was asked about his interest in the dark web and why he was looking at a site called Hitman International. Mitesh calmly stated he just wanted to see how it all differed from the normal internet. Mitesh was asked to detail where he was the day Jessica was murdered. He told the court he was texting a guy on a gay website that he was going to end up meeting with later. Then he went to the gym for a new session with a trainer, and that's how he scratched his neck. And then he went to the hospital. He wanted to see a nurse about his aching asshole. <laughs> yes, I said it, his aching asshole, which Mitesh admits is from having sex with men. Whoa, Matesh, you were asked to detail your day, but that might have been an overshare. Matesh goes on to tell the court, Jessica got home from work between 6.45 and 7. They talked, and he asked her to look at his asshole to see if she can see any damage. The prosecutor said to Matesh, Um, I'm sure you didn't want to broadcast the last moments you spent with Jessica was having her look up your behind but why didn't you tell the police that? Matesh said he panicked. He knew he would be blamed since he was the one that found her. Some of the information found on Matesh's computer were searches for strangulation how-tos and if men in prison were allowed to have sex. Ultimately, the court found Matesh guilty, and he was sentenced to life, which in the UK is a minimum of 30 years. And Rainbow Warriors, you know exactly how I feel about that. Don't fucking call it a damn life sentence when the judge sets the amount of years. Call it 30 years. Life sentence means until they die. That's so dumb. 
I love you, Rainbow Warriors. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs> <laughs>